all right so years ago we did a video covering the dead apostles that appear in fate Tsukihime, and other type moon works how they come about in the ranks and what that entails this was prior to the release of the near side of the Tsukihime remake the remake goes into greater detail giving us more information about these ranks and breaking down some more information that we didn't know about the others in the story a lot of this comes about when shiki asked arkaway to give him a summary of these vampires and just the thought had Arkaway zoning out, mainly because it's such an intricate conversation that she can't say one thing without giving up the rest. With her literally pulling out a dry erase board and diagrams out of nowhere. So we're going to get into that. To kick things off, every version of a dead apostle is just a Nasuverse version of a vampire. At the lowest level of these vampires is the corpse. They're described to be foot soldiers of the dead apostles that affected them. Someone who's had the their blood suck and they perish normally their basic functions are just sucking the blood of their master's targets or performing low-level tasks in their stead ultimately what a dead apostle wants is for all of their minions to transfer their blood back to them so they can build their reserves this would help the master survive and even grow stronger in the case of the dead apostle ancestor vlav archangel we've seen him summon multiple of these corpses in attempt to retrieve the body of arc away when she was severely wounded with just a lift of his finger these creatures started to emerge straight out of the ground in mass numbers now they're far too weak to withstand attacks from the main character shiki but for an ordinary human even these will become an issue without a proper response one of the reasons is that they're already dead you could do things like shoot them but it's not really gonna do anything unless you one shot them all together or just completely dismember their body the material tells us that their presence is so weak as a vampire that if he doesn't continue to give them orders they'll just go back to being dead they'll go back to how they were at the second stage you move up to the status of a ghoul we run into some of these in the alleyway in broad daylight shiki and arkaway are being attacked by a panther at the time and shiki is is telling the ghouls in the background don't come closer i don't want you getting attacked that is until he realized what the ghouls actually were he could only see their silhouettes at first he realized that the main reason that they kept pursuing him is because they don't have brains they don't have a brain they don't have a heart they don't have insides and this is something that the material gets into and it's that once you reach this stage their bodies are currently being reconstructed so there's nothing inside them and naturally since they don't have a brain telling them how to feel if something is dangerous or if they're doing too much they're more savage beings by default because they're not held back by these types of emotions another thing is that they have blood coming out of them as secretions so as they're walking with their arms out blood is falling out of their arms and once it hits the ground it turns into a line of flames wherever that blood landed arkaway who's been very used to hunting these creatures down she's never seen this variation before and she one shot at all of these ghouls at once she says that the average member of the dead is extremely slow she couldn't imagine being hit by one under normal circumstances so that's one of their drawbacks so the thing about these ghouls at least of this variation they have a molten rock design it covers their entire body and the reason for this is something that gets explained later on in the story ghouls can be infused with certain properties these for instance have the properties of flames it really just depends on their master the one that's over these ghouls is the dead apostle ancestor vlog and he does does have access to flame and ice attributes it later tells us how when vlog was taking the lives of these people some of them had their bodies completely submerged in flames so when they turn the flames went inwards and it dispersed from their body not as like projectile so to speak but more like an aura the ghouls have been seen walking around him in abundance knocking down several civilians and turning them in less than a minute ripping apart their flesh there was a point where he was being shot at by an entire police force he completely ignored the bullets and had the ghouls just murk them right in front of him another drawback is once they're empowered with these flames they'll be reduced to ashes after a certain amount of time so they only have so long 
want to be this way. The next variant of these ghouls, we got the animals. When Shiki was at the hotel with Arkaway, an elevator opens up and he sees two dogs gnawing on the flesh of humans and they're scattered all over the floor of the elevator. These two are ghouls. And I just want to point out that some of the lines you see on the dog aren't a part of the dog's design. They still have the molten base, but the swirl lines are actually Shiki's mystic eyes activating. You know, he has the mystic eyes of death that pretty much allows him to one shot anything that will eventually perish. The lines are there to basically tell his brain that he can one shot all of these parts of the dog. That's why it shows up all over the entire dog, because he can pick where he pleases. He takes out the first dog without an issue, but on the second dog, he happened to miss the line by mistake and actually sliced the inside of his mouth. So even though the dog was hurt, Shiki's condition couldn't take effect, and the dog just continued to clamp down on Shiki's arm while the knife was stuck in his mouth. Shiki even points out the fact that if it was a normal dog, it would have at least stopped him, but this dog seemed to be unbothered by the wound. Ultimately, he ended up pushing the knife through the back of the dog's head and split its entire skull open. Guess what? Turns out the dog is still alive. Cause once again, this was a normal attack. So he didn't hit the line. So this again goes to show just how high a ghoul's durability is. So he finally pierces the line and took the dog out for good. One thing that he addressed when he was fighting the dogs is that he mentioned there's an exception for the dematerialized insides of animals. Shiki brought up the fact that the dog's brain was still intact. And the reason for this is that animals usually don't have the mental capacity to become a dead apostle, barring some exceptions. So there's no need for reconstruction. So it's implied that this part of that phase is skipped on their behalf. Another thing we learned from that scene is that from the bad end, these dog ghouls can act as a flame bomb. Now, Shiki has the mystic eyes of death. So when he hit the lines of these creatures, he can just neutralize this effect and stop it from happening altogether. But in the bad end, Arkaway was the one that took these dogs out instead. When she did this, she used the energy from her claws waves in the same fashion that she took out the ghouls in the alleyway. But what happened in this case is that the dogs burst into flames all over the hallway, flat out burning Shiki alive. Because although he does have these powers, he can't withstand that level of heat. Even he mentioned that normally a person wouldn't just go down from being set on fire immediately, but the flames of these dogs were so hot that it might as well have been like melting his body, and it turned him into ashes. Anybody that touches the flames of Vlov could potentially turn to ashes. In fact, Shiki said that the only fortunate thing about the situation is that the top half of his body burned first so he didn't have his brain to tell the rest of his body all of the pain that he would have to experience once it reached the lower side. This is some nasty work, I'm telling you. The third variant of these ghouls, and mind you that we're still on the second stage by the way, is just that much depth. The third variant is the arachnoid forms. This part of the novel was extremely hilarious to me because it really puts Shiki in a realistic light. He's having a conversation with Arkaway and he begins to notice something in the background that's not supposed to be there. And he can't help but wonder to himself, what the fuck is that shit? <laughs> Yo, it's so funny. I've been attacked by vampires, but they're just alter humans. So it's not really anything out of reason. I've been attacked by panthers in the alleyway. Kinda weird, but again, still in the realm of possibility. That right there looks like something you would see out of a movie. Why is that there? Like it was really starting to register that things are getting extremely out of hand. So this special breed of ghouls is thought to be created by Dr. Arak, who is Shiki's family doctor. This is something that also gets into the deeper side of her lore in Tsukihime. And the leading reason behind this thought is that there's many hits towards her being a dead apostle ancestor herself, or at least her having some relation to them. Again, the novel still isn't finished. We're still learning things about her, but it is something I agree with myself considering the context. Hence the name Dr. Arak or Dr. Arak. We see that 
these creatures have a humanoid build, but they have spider-like characteristics. When we first run into one, we see that he has this big gut that over time gets removed and turns into extra arms on his back, like on some real Lovecraftian type of timing. It really looks more like an alien than anything. You can also see this in some of the sketches for its design. Even the tips of its arms look like they were made to form mouths, and the face still has the eyes and the mouth of a spider. Ark is currently in a weakened state, we'll get into that too, but for that reason the ghoul was able to shoot his arms around her back and pierce her in the neck. Shiki tells us that the speed of these arms are exceptional, way too fast for a human to keep up with. Unfortunately for the ghoul, Shiki is really like that he's way beyond the average human. So Shiki cut off the other arms that it was trying to attack with with his mystic eyes, he severed his leg and then he pierced his core. This ghoul also turned in the ashes once it was killed but again this is a very fortunate situation for shiki most people would have a lot of trouble dealing with this now consider everything that i just told you and then consider that this was just the baby version of an arachnoid ghoul yes the baby we go over to the fight that ciel was having while shiki and arcaway were facing off against roa she looks up on the side of the building and starts to see a giant freak of nature that she later discovers to be a ghoul. This time around the creature is 3 meters long and it can now scale walls with its legs. Even CL starts to freak out because the church has never made documentation on this type of creature. So this is new to her too. It has 5 arms, 6 legs, thick skin that's been likened to tree bark, and giant tusks sitting on its shoulder. These tusks also serve to be a ploy. They're actually projectiles that can be shot at will by the creature and they reload after a certain amount of time. CL mentions that the speed for the projectiles too are incredible. That just coming into direct contact with one of them would blow her body into pieces. The smaller arms can extend to follow the targets like whips. They have a tracking feature. Even when CL tried to jump out of the way of these arms, they just switch directions and follow behind her. The giant arm is meant to deal with any enemy that decides to get close range. She pointed this out saying that it would bulldoze her if she came close. The drawback is that since the left arm is so massive, it throws off the entire balance of the monster and it slows it down altogether. We've seen it have durability that tanked an entire lightning strike from CL and kept moving like nothing happened. She says outright that despite it being a ghoul, it has the abilities that could rival a greater dead apostle, which is all the way at stage 7 of the process. We go over to CL's route and we get more information about this fight and I do want to point out that the translations are kind of jank the official ones haven't come out yet so this is the best we have so in CL's route she actually got injured by one of his shots the moment that she came in contact with it from that point she decided to waste no time she went all out she filled the creatures entire body full of black keys ripping off its left arm and defeated it she also tanked the hit from its left arm straight to her chest but what it really goes to show is the stark difference between when she's conserving her energy and when she's not. And it also says a lot about the ghoul considering that she had to go all out in the first place. The fact that she had to put in this much effort says a lot about the ghoul on its own. In the arc route when she's conserving energy, the fight would have been 10 minutes max. In her route, it took less than one. Switching over to the phase side of things, you have the ghouls that we see in phase zero. I've covered this quite a few times. The experimentation of Kirisugu's father that led to Shirley becoming a failed dead apostle and by extension everybody else on the island became ghouls. Shirley couldn't control it as we know so it never did get far. One thing about the fate world in Tsukihime is that everything isn't a 1-1 deal. If it happens in Tsukihime it doesn't mean that it automatically happens the same way in fate but at the very least they're in the same realm. Things like Sion being a dead apostle in the Tsukihime world going rogue. In FGO, her counterpart is merely a bloodsucker with implications of being more. In the Tsukihime world, you have her ancestor, Wallachia. 
who was a dead apostle ancestor. Ultimately, he ended up leaving Atlas Academy and becoming a dead apostle due to his research. In the Fate Worlds, he's just a dead apostle and he never left the Atlas Academy. So for stage three of the process, we have the undead. At this level, their brains have now been reconstructed, befitting to that of an actual vampire. They're unbothered by sunlight and they can blend in with society with the rest of the humans. The drawback is that they're still regaining their mental function. So there may be hiccups here and there that you can outright notice. Their intelligence won't be the same as it once was due to them being at this stage. And they also require a period where their body, their actual skin needs to be embalmed so they can maintain that human appearance. Everything that I mentioned from stage one to stage three is classified together. They're known as the dead. They're familiars that go out to do the master's bidding, whatever that case may be. They go out and suck people's blood. Human flesh also counts as nutrition towards their master the same way that blood does. It's important that these type of minions exist that can blend in with society so the master doesn't have to go out and track these things down themselves. Because if they do, they just might alert the holy church and then they're gonna try to track the vampire down. This makes it way more efficient for the vampire to hide underground in their coffin and the underlings go out and restore their energy among society. They they can however do this themselves if they have ulterior motives or they get desperate. We've seen this before with Law. By this stage, it's said that you're already on par with the typical above average mage, which says a lot on its own. For stage 4, you have the Nightkin. This is the first stage for the Night class of a Dead Apostle. This is the position where they start to become more of an actual threat, where they start to enter their more nocturnal stages, hence the Night portion. Unlike the other stages that lean more towards Towards their human nature, the material tells us that around this time they officially become half human have vampire so now they can be out in the sun like they used to the sun will actually make them sick it will make them feel like they have anemia because the amount of blood that's necessary for a vampire is in surplus in comparison to a human and we've even seen things like this from scion in the melty blood story we went over that at this point she had become a little further down the list than the night can but it had become extremely hard for her to operate in the sun after a certain amount of time and she's walking around all these humans trying to ignore these urges of going against her own kind and also having to deal with that mental trauma to boot. If a parent or somebody that's at least of the lesser dead apostle rank drinks the blood of their victim, they can skip all the stages I mentioned prior and go straight to this level. At this stage, you can operate independent from your parent. You're still under them, but you don't need to be glued at their side anymore. Your parent will start to recognize you more as an actual person as opposed to an object for them to just be used. Your strength will become more pronounced as a superhuman. So again, that's superhuman speed, superhuman strength, regeneration, you name it. Only one out of a thousand people ever reach up to this level. For the fifth phase, you have the nightmare stage. At this point, the vampiric curse that's in your blood starts to manifest certain powers that makes you more distinguished. These powers can come from either the characteristics of your parent or your own personality. It's also stated that you can now go up against the average executor from the holy church. Again, using Scion, who in the Tsukihime world is slightly past this level, her manifestation station was very unique. It combined both aspects from her personality and her master, giving her access to producing shadow clones with her mystic code. Her clones take it a step further than your average because they can apply some truly brutal damage before they disappear. The executor statement is something that holds weight as well. From the time that she went rogue, she had multiple run-ins with the Mages Association and the Holy Church from several executors, and Scion really didn't even tap into her vampire powers yet because she was trying to avoid them. She just has superhuman capabilities. In the sixth phase, you reach the state of an actual lesser dead apostle. This is the point of no return. You can no longer procreate as a human once you reach this level. Several examples here. We can start with Sasuke. I've mentioned her before. From her role in the OG Tsukihime, we know that her evolution wasn't even complete yet and she had already gained her very own reality marvel. 
her depletion garden, which gives her the ability to erase all the magical energy in the area, giving her the advantage for people that rely on this. You're forced to either go at her at close range or use Mystic Codes, and by this point, she's already superhuman, so good luck with that one. This would make it difficult for most mages to fight against her, other dead apostles, and even some servants depending on who they are. She is one of the only people unique enough to jump to this level straight from human due to her latent potential as a dead apostle. This was thanks to her having a psychic background that helped her expedite the process. Despite her only being a lesser dead apostle, it's stated that her reality marble alone puts her near the level of dead apostle ancestors. She's truly a force to be reckoned with, can't wait for her character to be explored more in the remake. Another lesser dead apostle we have is Roa, the serpent of Akasha, and one of the main antagonists of Tsukihime. Very smart guy, very dangerous guy. Again, he's like the Zoken of Tsukihime. As a human, he was originally part of the church. In fact, he's the one that created the burial agency before they took over. Despite the fact that they have limited immortality, this still wasn't enough for Roa. So he tricked Arkaway into drinking his blood, who is a true ancestor, the strongest of vampires, to further his development. He started to gain too much power among the ancestors and Arkaway's sister went to hunt him down and put him in his place. She's half true ancestor and half dead apostle ancestor herself and even she couldn't stop him. He was just that powerful. This is how he became an unofficial dead apostle ancestor himself. Collectively, the other members couldn't recognize his status because of what he was doing. So they kicked him out. You could almost say that they kicked him out for being too good, though he still had contact with some members like Nero. So it took Arkaway and the church working together just to get rid of him. To put all this into perspective, Roa was already an incredible mage. Then he got the knowledge of the church, the best of it, and on top of all of that, he became a dead apostle as the child of Arkaway. Literally the strongest type of vampire you can be. So yeah, he's got the trifecta going. This is also why he's an unofficial dead apostle ancestor. Because although they no longer recognize him, he has a lot of abilities that would make you regard him as somebody that's ancestor level. This is due to several reasons and it's really crazy. For one, he's a body hopper. You would have to kill his soul to completely get rid of him. Shiki's done this with his mystic eyes of death. Ciel has done this with one of her holy weapons from the church that literally negates reincarnation. By the time that the story comes around, he's already reincarnated 17 times and we watched the 18th take place in the middle of the story. The body with the dark hair and the pale skin, the open shirt, this is the one that you would normally see him in. And that just gets more into the lore of Tsukihime altogether. But basically, he took over Shiki's counterpart by having it slowly manifest in his body. That's how he keeps coming back. He picks a vessel and he has himself slowly manifest and then there's a trigger. And when that trigger happens, he can take over that body and come back to life. He has access to numerous spells, all of which that he's learned from reincarnating so many times, some that we haven't even seen yet. He has lightning spells. Surprise, Ciel was also one of his bodies. That's why she had the lightning spell that she used against the spider. He has lightning spells. He has Age of God spells. He can turn himself into electricity. He can cast spells instantly like Medea. He has a reality marble, bounded fields that drain your energy and give it back to him. Church sacraments, hypnotic spells, necro Romancy, amplifiers that strengthen his other spells, binding, the list goes on. On the fate side of things, in FGO specifically, in one of his reincarnations, he went up against Edmund Dantes. It took Edmund Dantes, who is literally one of the best servants there is, to stop him from coming back and take him out for good. In that world, Edmund ended up burning him alive with his flames, but Edmund's flames are different. They transcend normal flames and actually negated his reincarnation like CL's holy weapon. So yeah, that's just an example of a level
lesser dead apostle as crazy as it sounds it can't get worse than that another dead apostle that we gotta bring up is the church executor noel ultimately she was able to reach this state through a force transformation going back to dr iraq dr iraq just so happened to have a replica version of the idea blood the same idea blood that makes you an ancestor now this replica didn't exactly turn noel into an ancestor but it did shoot her all the way from being a human straight to the lesser dead apostle level she started to gain ancestor traits she gained the mystic eyes of one of the og ancestors rita rose these were the mystic eyes of roses basically anything that noel could think of she can trap your soul with her mystic eyes and have you go through that mental torture as long as it's in effect hers are fake so they're easier to get out of but that's what the real ones are supposed to do wild and then you have things like her combining her knowledge from the church to create things like spear fences or shoot her spears like vlogs projectiles or the gate of babylon it took her six injections for her to reach this level and these are the types of things that make dr iraq so sus because it's like why do you even have that for other apostles you have people like ah borzak from fate zero who became a lesser dead apostle via magecraft we've seen him turn an entire plane of humans into ghouls with his ghoul variant bees we know that he's destroyed an entire town with his bees alone i've already said it before this dude is like a stunt character he's barely even in the story and he's still that threatening so threatening that an experienced mercenary still had to sneak up on him to take him out you have people like jester from fate strange fate originally his name was dorothea he was a female she just survived long enough to live into the age of man with a new alias we've seen him casually lifting several times he has multiple bodies via the ability on his chest allowing him to flat out survive a zabanya from no name assassin which literally crushed his heart technically killing him in the process we've seen him tank multiple pseudo noble phantasms from the clan calitan police force before massacring them he has magical energy so impressive that it can be quantified he himself has mentioned that he could house no name assassin and multiple servants at the same time and it still wouldn't be a problem she could outright spam her noble phantasms still wouldn't be an issue he literally allowed no name to use her phantasm that summons several beasts on him just to show off his regeneration he can manipulate and attack people with his shadows and we're still learning things about him jester actually predates the release of this list so as i mentioned in the other video he doesn't have an official rank you could argue him for being around the greater dead apostle level but we really don't know that for sure you have the dead apostles curse of restoration which is their very own form of limited immortality a part of the vampiric curse is that their cell have become more advanced they're more dynamic than they were before this is the reason why having a lot of blood is such a huge deal they have a regeneration effect that not only heals them but it rewinds their body to a state just before the time that they got injured the closer it is to a full moon the better the regeneration and then the actual full moon is when they're at their best potential this is also why the quality of blood matters too things like virgin blood is more nutritious for them because it's untainted getting a hold of just one of them is worth multiple people that's normal but all in all as long as you keep the blood coming in they will remain immortal another part of the restoration depends on the apostle but usually it gets more efficient as you go down the line people like roa how about having the top half of his body blown off including his head by arcaway still came back when arcaway tried to pull out her marble phantasm crushing his entire vessel and splattering him all over the walls he still came back to life see this is where i head out arcaway brings up that there's other aspects that's been brought in from real myth as well things like being able to paralyze others with just their stare for that reason many dead apostles have mystic eyes these go all the way up to the rainbow rank you got binding compelling the target being able to shrink their body immolation which is setting them on fire creating illusions with their mind we got into that with noel and then cursing and that's just the ones that she brings up she says that any dead apostle that's good enough can have these but the power is relative to the person shiki for instance who isn't a vampire is rainbow level so technically his is even better than 
Arkaways. Hers is gold. She even called him out for this, calling him a monster, saying that he's lucky that somebody hasn't come and just ripped them out of his head altogether, considering just how valuable they are. For her eyes, she has the mystic eyes of enchantment. You have to make direct eye contact in order for them to work. On rare occasions, you have enchantments that can tap into the brain itself for brain control. Arkaway hinted at this earlier in the story, saying that if she really wanted to, she could manipulate Shiki to fight Vlav herself. There's times when Arkaway has used this for talking to Vlav, for example. When she takes on the role of the direct descendant of Broomstud with her mystic eyes and gives off the air that she's a real true ancestor. In that moment, he really starts to talk to her like she's his superior. He straightens up, he doesn't beat around the bush, he answers wholeheartedly, whereas when she's not doing this, he kind of just answers how he wants. For the lore of vampires turning into werewolves, dead apostles have been granted the access to beast familiars. Case in point, one of Vlav's dogs. People like Nero Chaos is a great example of this. His process is different, but he's made of every animal that's imaginable. Dogs, crocodiles, rhinos, crows, whatever. That was kind of his thing. But Ark is now telling us that even more apostles can use familiars on a lower scale by just absorbing them. I'll put it like this. Since they have limited immortality, they also now have incessantly decaying genes. So they use things like familiars to replace these cells to make up the difference. And then they gain parts of their functions. The longer you live as an apostle, the harder it is to make up for these cells. So powerful beasts end up becoming a good option. This also lets them return the beast to their original form, which makes it look like they're just sending out their familiar, when in actuality, the animal is really a part of them. Usually they only take in one to three, and birds and dogs are the ones that are the most common. If they take in too many bees, then their soul will end up being corrupted, because there's way too much going on. That's another thing that made Nero such a special case. She mentions in the story that she only knows one vampire that's taking in more than one, that being Nero, she doesn't bring up his name, but that's who she's talking about. For the lore of them turning into mist, you have dead apostles that can perform this as well. On a high level, they can diffuse their entire body into particles and spread themselves over a certain region, but this can only last for so long. On a low level, they can create their own clone, put their conscience into the clone, and then when they're finished with it, they can diffuse the body and return back to their and the fake will turn to mist in the same way. Ridiculous stretch by the way, but mist is mist apparently. The new makeup for their body requires that they continue to gain power, otherwise it's just gonna collapse on itself. That's why some of the oldest apostles are the strongest. Their bodies demand for them to be so. They also have to be precise with it. If they take on too much power at once, their bodies are just gonna collapse in the same way. So it's important that they pace themselves while doing this as well. At this rank, you can continue to create your own minions, but they can't go past this level due to your own position. When you create these subordinates, what's happening is you're applying your own vampiric curse into their bloodstream and having it later manifest in stages throughout their body. Only 1 out of 10,000 people ever make it to reach this rank. For our seventh phase, we have the greater dead apostles, or the superior dead apostles. This is the upper echelon level of the first. The material tells us that once you reach this level, you are a poison to the land just by existing. It's so far ahead of a lesser dead apostle that even though they're collectively in the same category, you can't even compare the two. Once you reach this state, an ancestor will start to acknowledge your power and give you additional abilities on top of the ones that you are already have. Even the average church executor couldn't go up against them, and it requires one of the higher scale members or a bunch of members working in tandem to even stand a chance. Given the proper circumstance, they will even defeat their own parent ancestor and take on their curse inheriting anything else that they might have to give. This is an extremely difficult feat in its own right considering just how long the dead apostle ancestors have been around. They have centuries upon centuries of experience ahead of them. It would take a fatal mistake on their part or a well thought out plan by their children for this to happen. And then another thing to note is the differences between the dead apostles in Tsukihime versus fate. In Tsukihime, the dead apostles will be stronger by default, 
because the human order is less reliable. The planet is just better protected in the Fey world, and therefore they have a stronger presence when it comes to Tsukihime. Being more specific, if you have a lesser dead apostle in Fey, and then you have one in Tsukihime of the same rank, the one in Tsukihime will naturally have better pull, just by the way the worlds work. The title dead apostle ancestor also doesn't exist in Fey. They're all collectively dead apostles no matter how strong they are. The eight phase gets into the successor stage. It's a dead apostle that's been hand chosen by a dead apostle ancestor to take their place. Once they made this selection, the material tells us that the idea blood of that ancestor will become the successors once they cease to exist. Basically, the idea blood or the hemonomic principle is the blood that makes the ancestor so unique. It's the cursed blood that embodies them as an ancestor altogether. So in turn, that will be what the successor inherits. And considering that there's 27 official ancestors, there's more than 50 successors that we're still learning about. It's even said that an ancestor can raise a vampire to this rank altogether if they take enough interest in them. Practically, they're the ancestors junior. And it says that these guys are even stronger than Vlog. And we're gonna get into Vlog soon enough. Another thing about their principle is that this law supersedes the law of the planet just by them existing. That is if they release it of course. And this is due to the principle being taken into their soul. There's actually an unknown ancestor tied to a principle involving swords. It'd be crazy if they somehow tied that back to Shiro. It would actually blow my mind. Because that was a new addition to the remake. So it would be more like Phase Zero where it was written in reverse. For the ninth and the final position in the Dead Apostle chain is the Dead Apostle Ancestor. The first Dead Apostles were created as a food supply. They were a blood source for the true ancestors. They've been around for millenniums. They existed long before the common era. Eventually, the Dead Apostle Ancestors battle against the true ancestors for their own independence. In a sense, when you think about it, it's like the Greek gods battling against the Greek Titans for their independence in the Titanomachia. The original Dead Apostle Ancestors were victorious and that's how they ended up getting free and we have all of these dead apostles all over the place. Then of course you have the church deciding to take a step in and then they started to hunt them down. Many of them have been sealed away by the church and many of these guys are still on the run and their status is unknown. That's another thing. The dead apostle ancestor list is in perpetual rotation. And the reason for this is that the dead apostle ancestor title can be usurped by another dead apostle or someone that defeats them in general. So with that in mind, you got the OG dead apostle ancestors and you got the new age dead apostle ancestors. Vlav is a great example of this. He's one of the new age dead apostle ancestors. Originally, Vlav is only supposed to be a lesser dead apostle, which is rank six. But since he killed off his own master, he was able to shoehorn his way into this rank due to his own unique abilities and his background. So right now we'll just do a primer since I plan on going into the complete dead apostle ancestor list anyway. So for Vlav, some of his powers include the fact that he has an authority over freezing. Basically, their authority is a blood principle. It's the concept where their powers stem from. Again, given the proper circumstance, Vlav can deprive the heat of everything that's in his surroundings all the way to absolute zero, which in scientific terms is negative 273 degrees Celsius something that nobody could survive in. In fact, multiple times throughout the fight that he had with Shiki and Arkaway, Nasu made it very clear that if you're within range of this man, you are highly likely going to die from harsh conditions alone. So going back to the Mages vs. Dead Apostles video, bump the chance of going against Vlob personally, you couldn't even get near him. You would literally just freeze or burn to death. Unless you're one of the best of the best, which at that that point you've already proven that he's more than formidable so for him depending on which cannon that you use it took either seals holy weapon or shiki's mystic eyes of death to get rid of him shiki's mystic eyes of death perception is something comparable to king hassan striking the death into things that's just how rare it is that's just how cheap it is so good luck finding something on that level he has blue flames that allow him to suck the heat out of most living beings this helps him take over corpses without completely burning them to ashes and then you have his 
these orange flames that can be manipulated into massive hands and thrown as projectiles. These orange flames can reach up to 3000 degrees Celsius and will literally melt you into nothing. He's an expert swordsman, he has a machete that he uses at close range, he has a massive lance that he can summon from his own shadow. This lance is like the size of six midges, I kid you not. Apparently the Lancer class is really full of vampires. He iced out an entire line of buildings in word for word less than two seconds and this was from missing his attack. He iced out everything that was around him when he released his principal including all of the city that was nearby when he got to the hotel where Shiki and Arkaway were located. He killed everybody in it except them, 200 people. And technically, he did this on accident. He did this just from being in their presence. He didn't even care about them. They just so happened to be there. It's been said by Arkaway that cutting off his limbs and leaving him still alive is tantamount to suicide. You might as well just forfeit your life. And then somebody drove into him with the van and the van split in two. He didn't even move. And of course, there's more where that came from. Arkaway mentioned that Vlav is a dead apostle that's regarded as a castle lord. These are the dead apostles that go into towns, villages, and cities, build up their community of underlings as much as they can, and then turn around and destroy everything that's there, and then move on to the next. She even mentioned that left unattended, Vlav would have burned the entire city to the ground. We've seen a lot of this mayhem starting up just prior to their fight. Arcus stated that the ancestors might as well be recognized as kings, and the territories that they go around creating are their nations. It takes centuries for the church to create a holy weapon that can seal these ancestors. They're just that hard to keep up with and just that powerful. Art goes into further explanation that there's two types of vampires. There's the entire list that I mentioned, the dead apostles, people that were turned into vampires, and then there's the true ancestors, people like Arkaway, her father, the Crimson Moon, and her sister, Altro, who were born as vampires. Her father is also a type. I did an entire video covering what they are. The types protect the planets. Basically, the Earth can't make its own type, so it called out to the moon for help. This set the foundation for Crimson Moon's children to exist, the true ancestors. They're part of the counterforce. The true ancestors are the highest level of elementals there is. They're the highest level of fairies there is. Essentially, they're protectors of the planet. Not protectors of humans, but the planet specifically. Ark has even said she could care less about what humans got going on. That's none of her business. Naturally, with the true ancestor's father being the Crimson Moon, the Vampire King, they are the progenitors to vampires, so they too desire blood. They don't need the blood per se, but it's strictly something that's a part of their design. It's a part of those vampiric impulses. This is where the OG dead apostle ancestors come in. Originally, they were a special number of dead apostles that were meant to be a backup reserve for them. 27 of them to be specific. When it comes to the weaknesses of these dead apostle ancestors, they have a weakness to sunlight and they're only as good as the amount of blood that they have. When they start to lose these reserves, everything else starts to go on the decline as well. True ancestors, on the other hand, have no real weakness. Even when they can't get a hold of blood, they just become more ferocious or they just fall into eternal slumber because they don't have a natural death. Sacraments can't get rid of them, sunlight doesn't work against them, Ark has mentioned that she can completely nullify things like Age of God level runes if she needed to. You need conceptual weapons with some of the highest mystery in order to do some effective damage. She mentions a lot of these can be located in South America. This is very telling considering where LB7 and FGO takes place. With all of that in mind, eventually there came an issue. There was a group of fallen true ancestors known as the Demon Lords who fell hostage to their urges and started to take out humans for their blood beyond their original reserves. This led them into going into battle against their ancestor brethren who still refused to drink. Naturally, since the demon lords had already drunk the blood, they were stronger. The materials telling us that at this point, even a human couldn't oppose them. They were mad with power. It was fairly obvious that the lords were going to wipe out their own race. By this point, the true ancestors had already dropped down to a hundred 
100 people. They had to be stopped somehow. So around the 12th century, this is when the Crimson Moon created Arcaway. She was a defense that was made against these type of ancestors to make things right again. She was also meant to hunt down these dead apostles who could be viewed as rebels as well. But she was born just like everybody else. So they had to still raise her first. Years down the line, the ancestors started to reach out to the Holy Church to get some help with these demon lords. In the story of Kagetsu Toya, Roa tells us that there were only 10 demon lords around at this time, and that was already far too many. So he was sent out as one of the people to deal with them. The thing is, Roa always had a hidden agenda. From here, he runs into Arkaway, and like I brought up before, he managed to trick her into drinking his blood. This caused Arkaway to go into a frenzy, and she ended up eliminating every ancestor that was left, including the demon lords, omitting one additional demon lord that was revealed in the remake. This demon lord fought against one of the members of the church, this being the Bishop Mario. Because of that event, Arkaway hasn't drunk blood since, at least until the story rolls around. She hasn't drunk blood since the 12th century, and she felt so bad about what she had done that every time Roa reincarnates, she hunts him down because technically she's the one that created him. Now when it comes to Ark herself, as you can plainly see, she has a lot going on with her character before we even meet her in the story. She's at her best when she drinks blood, but she loses her sanity due to her vampiric impulses. That means that when the story rolls around, she's already operating on a near millennium nerf. Then the main character Shiki kills her the moment that you meet her. He chopped her up into 17 pieces with his mystic eyes and she has to waste even more energy bringing herself back to life. Yes, Arkaway brought herself back to life the moment the story started. She flat out put her entire body back together from scratch. Even with all of those things considered, she's ultimately still stronger than everybody else. Just to name a few things, she can warp reality, manipulate earth, rip textures off of buildings, completely reform her body, she's got her marble phantasm, she's got a reality marble, she can manifest chains from her reality marble, these chains can hold a hundred tons each. She flat out ate 3000 degrees celsius from Vlog and said that it wasn't even that hot, stating that she could take more. Huh? And like I said before, she locks herself up in the castle, bound by a thousand chains because she knew when she got on bad timing, it would end up like that again. In her base form, for example, she says out her own mouth that she would roll Vlog if she wasn't weakened. There was a point where Shiki thought that Vlog might have been stronger than her due to her weakening and she said that she was actually offended that he would even make this assumption. She says that at 10% of her power he was barely stronger than her, at 30% of her power she could fight him on her own and at full strength she would crush him just by looking at him and I've already mentioned how strong he is. Another example, you have the same Mario that works for the church. Keep in mind that he incapacitated one of the demon lords, okay? In the story, he tries to play with Ark on the same type of timing, and she literally dog walked him. He was so confused. He tried to pull a sneak attack, and somehow she still ended up on top. As the old proverb goes, eventually you gonna find out. As a matter of fact, Mario is from the eighth assembly of the church. He's over the executors, and he still couldn't do anything to her. He sent out more than 30 executors laced with anti-ancestor equipment, and she soloed them all in seconds. Then she cut off Mario's arms and legs and left him to bleed out. And he survived that too, just to show that he's not some pushover. We're still learning about that. I still feel the way that they took my boy Nira out for the remake, which is funny because I do like Vlob. Don't get it twisted, Vlob is hard. It's just that Nero was that original staple, and personally, I felt like he was underused, so I can't help but feel like he was robbed. The scenes like Vlav attacking Shiki with his dogs, those were supposed to be Nero's dogs, the ancestor Nero Chaos. He was one of the original 27. Arkaway has already mentioned in story that she's not aware of any more dead apostles in the country, so unless he takes some type of a trip, that's pretty much saying that we're going to be waiting for some time. That's fine, because I will not rest until he gets justice. Hello, I'm a Type Moon fan. 
I make the Don't Sleep series, I was born for this. Now that we're on this video, for all the people that keep saying, well, Sai, you never do any Tsukihime content, man. Where's the Tsukihime content? You never do any type moon stuff anymore, man. Let's see what happens, and you will find out why. 